I'm really running dry on ideas, and Todd's doing something. Some more boomer games for you, I guess. Half-Life's a pretty good game, and being Valve's first foray into games, it holds up remarkably well. You play as Gordon Freeman, a 27-year-old, canonically 6'2", MIT student with a degree in theoretical physics working at Black Mesa, whose day job it is to shove big-ass crystals into big-ass lasers. On regular shoving crystal into laser session, Gordon accidentally shoves the rock in at 80 miles an hour. causes a resonance cascade which bridges the two worlds of Earth and the alien planet Zen together. Gordon then has to take himself through Black Mesa to the surface, then get to the Lombata complex so that he can go through a portal to kill a giant space fetus known as the Nihilith who is keeping the rift from Zen to Earth open. Retire! Along the way, Gordon fights knockoff facehuggers, the zombies made by these facehuggers, vomit dogs, soundwave dogs, vortigons, and the HECU, or Hazardous Environment Combat Unit. These guys were presumably sent by the government to contain the situation, which definitely turned out well. The story, at least in Half-Life 1, only seems to accompany the game, and not provide much depth to the actual game, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's part of the reason why games like Doom, Quake, and other games from that era end up holding up today. However, not having a story ultimately undermines the ending, and without memorable characters like Alex, Eli, or Dr. Kleiner to latch onto, the cliffhanger ending just lacks the punch that the Half-Life 2 trilogy had. Combat is extremely simple in this game. You've got everything from a clock, to a crossbow, to rocket launchers and sash charges, some plasma ray beam things, bugs, and... You want to know how to use them? Click on enemy, and enemy go bye-bye. Enemies are even simpler. To fight any alien enemy, 1. Keep your distance, 2. Left click. The same also applies to the Heku, however two of the game's biggest core problems reveals itself with the Heku. AI often feel like husks with no cohesion. Their voice lines will sometimes have relation to what's happening, and they all have the same base, which makes all of the enemies feel the same. Only some of them will even charge you when you're turtling behind cover, and others will take cover behind explosive boxes. They seemingly actively search for cover only to come charging back at you. Compared to games like Fear or or even Counter-Strike Condition Zero, another game made in the Gold Source engine, this feels really weak. The Haku's AI is also infamous for hucking grenades farther and with more precision than Tom Brady in the fourth quarter. I don't watch football at all. This on paper is good because it makes the player take advantage of Freeman's relatively fast movement, but you can get shredded to bits by the hit-scanning Haku, which incentivizes you not to use movement and to use cover. So why do they flush you out so often and so fast if you lose health to them so fast? This, paired with honestly weak death animations and a lot of hits lacking force, stacks up to near ruin the flow of combat in what is arguably the most combat-focused Half-Life game. This is the perfect example of the issues with the Heku. One of them threw a grenade, which bounced off the Heku in front of him, exploded, killed both of them, while the Heku in front of them threw another grenade, which exploded and hurt me. How does this happen? Mods like Brutal Half-Life fixes some of the problems with Half-Life's combat. Who knew adding more punch to hits would make the hit feel like they have more punch? These problems also seem to slip away when playing the deathmatch mode. Not only do you no longer have to deal with the lackluster AI, the way enemies are damaged translates very well into the arena shooter style gameplay like Quake, which is a very interesting detail. <laughs> Where Half-Life really excels is in crafting a believable environment through showing glimpses of what's happening in day-to-day -day life by walking you through it. You see the everyday processes of the Black Mesa facility, you see people trying to fix a blue screen computer, you see a meeting between the fabled G-Man and a scientist, you see someone's casserole heating up in the microwave. This quality and detail persists even after the Resonance Cascade. Zombies eating dead scientists and people trying to escape to the surface. 
In the chapter, we've got hostiles are introduced to the Heku from a soldier mowing down a scientist. Not only is this brilliant to introduce the true motives of the Heku, but it really adds to the environment of Black Mesa where everything went wrong. This quality reflects in most of the environments, however, later levels seem to decline in quality with Zen. Zen is a massive drop in quality from the earlier levels in the game. They're not atrocious, but they almost feel half-baked. And their problems aren't complicated either. Platforming shouldn't be in a ground in FPS. Half-Life shouldn't have dedicated boss enemies, which is why there weren't any in previous levels. It feels rushed. So why is that? It, it's, it's because it was rushed. <laughs> Valve was originally founded by Harvard Dropout and former Microsoft employee Gabe Newell and another former Microsoft employee Mike Harrington. Both were partially inspired to make their own gaming company by another former Microsoft employee Michael Brash, who went on to work with id Software on Quake. So, after founding their own company, Gabe and Mike did the most sensible thing to realize the overall scope of their new game. Talk with Abrash and the Ed team about the Quake engine, in which Abrash later said that, quote, These were the guys that worked on Microsoft Bob and Home Automation. You're not going to walk into the Quills game company on the face of the earth and say, Wow, nice to hang out with you. But being the <coughs> smart people that Gabe and Mike were, they wanted to be realistic with their new project and build from the work that John Carmack and the rest of the IT team had already put into the engine rather than start from scratch. Inspired from games like Doom, Quake, and Stephen King's The Mist, their newly found team set to work on their new game with the working title Quiver, which I guess is named after a military base in The, in the Mist? I don't know, I'm not reading a book for this video. There were many limitations with the original Quake engine, so they ended up creating skeletal animations and changing a majority of the engine's code. Valve desperately needed a publisher, but publishers were wary of new upstarts with no work to show, and with Valve's ambitious ideas, publishers didn't want to take the risk. Enter Sierra Online. Sierra Online at the time was looking into getting into the FPS genre, and with founder of Sierra Ken Williams directly getting an email from Gabe Newell, they agreed to meet. However, the day they were supposed to meet, there was a massive snowstorm in Seattle, and Half-Life as it was, was shelved. Just kidding, they powered through the snow in Mike Harrington's four-wheel drive. Ken Williams was the only other person to make it to the Sierra office that day, and within 20 minutes, he was sold. Valve originally aimed for a November 1997 release to compete with Quake 2, but by that time the game was deemed unfun to play, with little design cohesion, and was deemed no better than a level pack for Quake. Hmm, which is a very interesting detail. Valve delayed the game and reworked every single level. To start this process, Valve assigned a small team to make one level containing every single part of the game. They iterated and added to the level for an entire month, and when the rest of the team played the level, it was unanimous that this would be the baseline for the game. Valve made a three-part list of what made the level design good and fun. Firstly, multiple events happen that are triggered by the player and not a timer to keep the player engaged. Secondly, the level reacts to player interaction through doors, boxes, or bullet decals. And finally, the game shows players eminent danger beforehand, allowing them to avoid it. To focus on this unified design, Valve set up a small group made up of six people from all the departments dubbed the Cabal, with many Cabals going forward with the decisions made by their departments. By the end of it, the Cabal had made a nearly 200-page design doc detailing almost every single part of the game. The Cabal had also worked on a 30-page document detailing the narrative and hired science fiction author Mark Laidlaw to manage the script. With the founding of the Cabal, productivity went through the roof, so much so that the members of the Cabal were switched out almost every week due to burnout. Within a month, other team members started on detailed game development, and within two, testing was happening at Sierra. Between the Cabal and playtesting, the team was able to weed out anything deemed unenjoyable. However, early development builds of the game and details seemed to be lost to time, as their VSS quote-unquote exploded three months before launch, with logs before the last month of development seemingly gone. And, according to employee Eric Johnson, code had to be recovered from individual computers. Half-Life, despite a crazy crunch time, towards the end of 1998 was released on November 19th through critical acclaim and permanently changed the gaming landscape. It's a miracle this game came out the way it did. Half-Life 1 probably started development sometime in mid to late 1996, so they scrapped a year's worth of development in 1997 and then started to completely redo a majority of the game within four months. And on top of that, even after E3 1998, they still had a lot of crunch time to meet the November 1998 release. 
My guess is that they turned the game around, wrote a 200-page design doc and a 30-page document detailing the entire narrative, finished all of the levels, had it playtested and bug-tested within 14 months. I could be completely wrong here thanks to lost archives of the game, but from all the information I have gathered, this seems right. And with quotes like personal hygiene is at an all-time low, and GameSpot's The Final Hours of Half-Life revealing that they were actually late to releasing it in 1998, I don't think it's too far off. Despite development troubles and a bad ending, Half-Life 1 remains my favorite Half-Life game to date, and my second favorite Valve game ever only second to the holiest of names. And while combat is a little weak, the way the game sets up its atmosphere is brilliant, and it oozes personality, and the story isn't half bad either. So that's it? Good game, development troubles, Zen isn't very notable? I mean, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but yeah. You don't have any other problems with the game? I do have one. Half-Life 1 is actually Doom 2. So...